Okay, folks, welcome back. Here we are in the course of Fundamental Principles in Bioethics within the program of the Master of Science in Bioethics at St. Thomas University. And we're well along the way into the course already. And um, first, as always, if there are any questions or comments from previous lectures or anything in the course, the program, Okay, well, I hear none, then I'm going to move forward. Just a brief uh, recap of uh, what we have been doing so far. We're looking at the phylogenetic origin of the human species. Phylogenetic origin of the human species, both from the scientific and the theological or religious perspective. And the point here is that far from the perception that it's either creation or evolution, they actually complement each other at different levels to give us the fuller view of how the human species arose. Because what is undeniable is the fossil record, for example, what is in front of us. And even deeper than that and more complete than that is the phylogenetics that we've been getting into, but now we're going to focus on the human species as such. Then the ontogenetic origin of uh, the human species of each individual, we'll see in the next course coming up with the bioethical issues at the beginning of human life. All right, so there's a two step here. But now we're looking at the origin of the human species as a whole. Scientifically, biologically, I'm talking about Homo sapiens or depending on who you read, Homo sapiens sapiens. <laughs> Now, uh, so in this lecture, we're going to be looking at the phylogenetic evidence for the evolution of our species, also the fossil record. And then we're gonna zero in on skull and skull sizes. Then we're going to make a, at least an association and possibly even a correlation between the size of the human skull and development of culture. Culture. So you see, it's kind of a leap there from the physiological to the psychological, which is complementing the picture of the human person. We're also going to look at bipedalism, the origin of bipedalism and the consequences, the synergy that develops between freeing the forelimbs, in other words, the FORE limbs, the forward appendages, freeing them up, and the synergy that occurs with the brain, with an increased brain size, essentially to make tools, right? And that puts us then in a different category because tool making is the origin essentially of the technology that surrounds us today, including the James Webb uh, uh, telescope, astronomical telescope that deployed in space and is now transmitting uh, images from almost the origin, the background radiation of the universe. So it's just fascinating and dangerous, <laughs> the technology that we have developed today, okay? All because the hands were freed up for doing stuff. All right, then we'll look specifically at the issue of fire, harnessing fire and how fire also contributed to the development of the species. At least at the genus level of Homo. And finally, the culture in the broad sense, not in the narrow sense of culture today, like pop culture and music and, and food and so forth, but the broader sense of culture, which is human endeavor, including the practice of religion or the possibility of religion, of worship, which again is unique as far as we can tell from all the other species that surround us. Professor. I have something to contribute to the conversation. Please do. Um, so tools, I, when I was in graduate school, I studied tool, I had a, I had a three month stint studying chimpanzees and tool making. Yes. And there's actually videos online, I'll show you them next week, about a, a chimpanzee named Kanzi that I actually studied when I was in graduate school and his ability to make tools. And it, it's very interesting that you bring this up because one of the aspects of evolution and things like that is the ability to reason that you need something else to do something. And the perfect example everyone in this classroom has seen 
on that show that your parents made you watch years ago. Remember Mutual Omaha? You guys, you know, <laughs> yeah, you probably, you're, you're not that old, but you probably remember Mutual Omaha. Mm -hmm. And um, they used to make termite sticks. You guys remember the chimpanzees making termite sticks? Yes. They, would take, they would take a stick and they would put it in the termite mound and pull up the termites yes. and eat them off the stick. Exactly. So that was a, one of the earliest examples of tool use. And so, it, very briefly, we would we would study these and we would present them with problems like to cut an orange, and they had to pick the proper tool, which was a knife, to cut the orange, mm -hmm. and that's a real higher level cognitive ability. It, it was fascinating. So if you ever go, if you, they're on YouTube. And the name is Kanzi with a K. Mm -hmm. Kanzi the chimpanzee. He can actually communicate. He could. He's, I think he passed. Right. Um, but he could also make tools. Did he, did he go for the knife first, or did he cut, kind of just go one by no, one? No, no. He, he, you know, and, and, and we as students question the training. Right. We as students, how much have they been trained? You know, does this chimpanzee truly, and I remember when writing my paper, my term paper, we were writing about tools and saying, okay, is this something that they were trained to do, or does this, under, do they understand the knife cuts? Right. right. And so we actually presented them with another complete, so this is really cool. We presented them with another complete um, problem. In, in my group, we presented them with what was called a puzzle box. And so the puzzle box was a banana inside a box, a wooden box, but it had a rope that tied it closed. We knew, we, we showed the chimpanzee the banana before we put it in the box. They knew that, that the banana was in there. But they had to figure out how to to uh, to get to the banana. And our chimpanzee went in and used a knife to cut the rope. Wow! So the chimpanzee. So my summary of my yeah. first paper was this, that that chimpanzee truly understood what the knife did. It wasn't training because we presented right. with a new problem, and it was fascinating. It was fascinating. So if you get a chance, go on and take a look at Kanzi with a K. Kanzi. Um, and it's it, the yeah. videos are really old because um, <laughs> I'm really old. Black and white. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Colorized I'm everything. I'm so excited about that. That's, that's great that you're talking about. It is fantastic. And in fact, well, we'll get into it in greater detail further down the lecture. But uh, we also make a distinction, or actually anthropologists make a distinction between the use of a tool and making a tool to make a tool, right? Which is a higher level yet. So one thing is to use a tool, like uh, Professor Plunkett uh, pointed out, like the twig for termites. And in fact, we know that even uh, non-primates have used some tools, crows in particular, that are also very intelligent. They will also use a twig to pull something out from a hole. Fascinating. But and, then- and, and Kanzi went on and he went ahead and made his own tool. So he actually he made on tool. the same tool and yes. on Saturday morning. Right. He went on and made his tool out of shale. Look at that, exactly. So something that cuts, right? Yes. A sharp edge. Yes. So that's, and it is definitely like you mentioned, Doctor. it's a higher function. Yeah. It's a higher function of abstract thought, which is imagination really in the frontal lobe. I mean, psychologists tell us this and they study the frontal lobe and it's a higher function because it's conceptualizing a function from the structure to get to the function. And of course, very few animals are able to do that it's no wonder that we have 99% uh, phylogenetic compatibility with the chimp, right? Our closest uh, relative. In fact, when we take the break, I'm gonna ask you to just down the hallway, a little bit down the hallway to the right, you'll see the skeleton of panfragloditis, which is the scientific name for the chimp. And it's our closest relative, right? And we'll see actually when we diverged from the chimp at the genus level, about between five and eight million years ago. But the, the fossil record is there and it's just really elegant to put it together and to see how we came to be, you know, as a species. So how about we get right into it? Hmm? I think I'm coming next time. <laughs> Let's stick around. <laughs> it is really cool. <laughs> yeah, well, the beauty of this, as you know, uh, is that we have been building the case First, for evolution, you know, as a scientific fact, as a fact of nature, because in presenting you the evidence, 
precisely from uh, phylogenetic homology, from the fossil record, from comparative embryology, and even down at the molecular level and so forth. So all the evidence for evolution, in fact, the four main forces of evolution, mutation, migration, drift, and selection. We dedicated a whole lecture to the different types of selection and so forth. So now this has been the background, if you will, the prereq for understanding now human evolution as a species, biologically speaking, right? Because we cannot deny our physicality, the fact that we actually uh, um, have a, a body that metabolizes just like every other living thing that is on this planet and that biologically we belong to the mammals. So again, using uh, phylogeny, which is interesting because remember this is the Linnaean phylogeny which was uh, developed by Carolus Linnaeus over two centuries ago. And that paradigm is still valid today using as the universal classification of all species that we continue to find on this planet. Right, beginning with the phylum of chordates, not vertebrate, because remember the vertebrate is a subphylum. And I mentioned that because all of these categories, the ones that we're familiar with, the big categories, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, they all have sub and supra categories, which we seldom see, right? Because it's getting granular, it's getting into the details of phylogenetics. But if you're a taxonomist, you would know about sub and supra categories of each one of these seven big ones. Mm -hmm. And so one that we are familiar with is the vertebrates. But the vertebrates is a subphylum of the chordate. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, at the level of class, mammal, primate, order, primate, or primates, family, hominid. Now, here's another one that's a subcategory is Tribe, hominin, the hominini in Latin, hominini. You probably have uh, seldom heard that word, but this is very, very relevant to us because this is at the level of genus, right? The genus Homo. And then finally, species, Homo sapiens, of which we're the only species, but there is again the fossil record, which I'll present the evidence uh, to you of other Homo non sapiens who have existed throughout uh, evolutionary time, okay? All extinct now. But the last one, Neanderthalis, we coexisted, Sapiens and Neanderthalis coexisted until about 20,000 years ago in Europe. And somehow we wiped them out. Remember back when we talked about the environmental uh, bioethics course on competitive uh, exclusion principle? Well, we basically compete outcompeted the, the Neanderthals. Even though paradoxically, the Neanderthal was larger, more muscular, right? And perhaps even more hairy than the human. In uh, think of uh, cold winters in Europe and survival skills, right? And abilities. And yet we out, uh, even with a slightly smaller brain volume, we outcompeted them. So what happened there? That's going to be the difference between maximizing and optimizing a, a trait. Okay. We'll get there. So the phylogenetics, you see, we share more common characteristics as we get larger, broader in the categories, all the way down to eukaryotes, of which we share a membrane nucleus, protected DNA. Okay. So even with the paramecium, <laughs> we have some homology, which is membrane nuclei, that our DNA within each one of our, the trillions of cells is protected with a double membrane. Okay. So uh, we have seen percentage homology before, but I'm going to uh, concentrate now on uh, primates, where we have a percentage homology, and here's a time scale in millions of years, going back from the present to 90 million years ago. So the common ancestor of all the primates is between 90 and 80 million years ago. Common ancestor, again, according to the fossil record. Now, keep in mind, there's always a caveat with the fossil record, all right, because of the paucity, in other words, the poverty, if you will, of the fossil records. We find 
a bone or two bones or three bones. And mostly today with computer imaging, we build a whole skeleton from a few bones, right? This is where the anatomists and the physiologists come into play and the, uh, the orthopedics, the bone people. Then once we have a skeleton, we put muscle on that skeleton and then adipose tissue. And eventually we get to the integumentary tissue, the skin, right? And we can see more or less, more or less how that creature would have looked like back then. But remember, we're starting with fragments of bones. So it's a, it's a work in progress, right? Uh, I have uh, more to say about uh, the, the fossil record when we get into it, but uh, sticking to the phylogenetics uh, of the phylogenetic tree, you can see the branching off. There was a major branching off uh, between six and seven million years ago. And then what we call an expansive radiation. And I've talked about this before that typically we have evidence, right, of at least five uh, mass extinctions and expansive radiations in the history of life on Earth over the billions of years. And the last one, right, was about 65 million years ago, more or less. Hmm? Give would take a few millions. And that last mass extinction uh, extinguished what? The dinosaurs. The dinosaurs, which had radiated tremendously from herbivores to carnivores, right? But they have basically taken over. It's another example, the dinos, uh, the phylogenetic tree is another example of runaway evolution, all right? Or runaway selection that I covered in the previous class. So look at this, how this coincides so beautifully with that datum. Between 70 and 60 million years ago, what do we get? An expansive radiation of one class of animals, right? In general, remember I mentioned that uh, the most common mammal during the time of the dinosaurs was a little mouse-like creature that looked like a little tiny hot dog with a few legs and, uh, well, four legs, obviously, and spent its time buried under rocks because whenever they came out, the dinos would wipe them out, right? Eat them up. And so one day, because this was a dramatic event, what happened uh, again, that uh, meteorite uh, buried into what is today the Yucatan Peninsula, it's still, the, the chunk is still there about three or four miles into the crust of the earth, right? <laughs> By satellite imaging and so forth, they've been able the geologists have been able to figure that out. That created such a massive uh, fire and cloud of ash and dust and whatnot that covered the whole earth for several months, maybe years, uh, killing most of the plants and therefore killing most of the herbivores and therefore killing most of the uh, uh, carnivores. So almost overnight, almost overnight in figurative language, these little hot dog uh, uh, mice came out and said, no dinos, hooray, it's our time, it's the time of the mammals, <laughs> and they took off. <laughs> and also it coincided with a winterization of the planet, in other words, colder, and therefore hair as a survival characteristic, and you put in all the natural selections that we've been talking about, play it forward, now we're in the age of the mammals, you see? And thanks be to God that the reptiles stay really small <laughs> to the level of lizards and so forth. But when, again, this phylogenetics is also a work in progress because when you talk to some uh, herpetologists who are the scientists who study reptiles, right? They say, no, no, the dinosaurs are still around. They just took to flight. And so now the new thinking is that birds are a subcategory of the the reptiles, because you can think of a feather as a very sophisticated scale, <laughs> okay? And what did they use as proof? Phylogenetics. In other words, they got down to the molecular level, they actually do DNA analysis on the feathers and the scales and so forth, and they see mm, tight fit between birds and reptiles. Interesting. Survival, right? Anyway, uh, thanks be to God, the birds are much more benevolent to mammals than uh, were the dinos. Okay, uh, moving forward then, 
I want to concentrate on hominids as a family. Hmm? Again, it's down here of all, these are all families of the uh, primates. And here, the what is known as the apes or the great apes, right? They are the hominids and there are four, four great apes that are extant today, that are existing today. Orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. We do the phylogenetics, we do the percentage homology, whether it's DNA or proteins, and we find with the orangutans, 97% homology, approximately. Gorillas, 98% homology. Chimpanzees, 99% homology. Okay. So, in fact, this little fellow is holding a tool, <laughs> which can also sub in as a weapon. <laughs> a specialized tool is a weapon. Okay. So let's look at this divergence, again, from the fossil record and mostly skulls because of all the bones in a body, of course, these are internal skeleton, right? So these are all uh, chordates, vertebrates. Of all the bones in the body, which do you think is the most informative as far as structure and function? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Not only, obviously, the volume, so approximate brain size, right? But we're actually measuring a volume inside a skull, which can be done by uh, CT, computer tomography, but also the jaw, the upper jaw and the lower jaw. And in particular, what about the jaws, in the jaws, literally, that is also very informative about behavior? Exactly. Homodont, heterodont, right? In other words, we are not homodonts like fish, which typically have conical teeth all the way around. They don't really chew their food much. They grab, yank, and swallow, <laughs> right? Tear and swallow. But we are heterodonts. In other words, we have teeth that are a variety of sizes and shapes from the molars, the premolars, the incisors, and the uh, canines about four different shapes of teeth. And, and again, the dictum, remember the dictum? Forms, form, follows, what? Function, form follows function. In other words, the shape of the thing is according to the function of the thing, the structure is according to the function and not vice versa. So think of the molars, for example, they're flat, kind of big, squarish. They match each other, upper and lower jaw. Right, and we can also move our jaw laterally. So what's your intuition about molars? What kind of food, what's it used for? Tearing? No, grinding, exactly, for grinding, you see? So that points to the possibility of herbs, of uh, vegetation, especially grains, which are molecularly carbohydrates, high in energy, the carbs, starch, right? So the molars, but then we have the uh, uh, canine for tearing, but not to develop. You compare our canines with the canines of a chimpanzee, for example, or even uh, a feline like a cat, a house cat, or I, I forgot to bring a little skull of a cat with the long canines, right? They're kind of disproportionate to the rest of the skull and the body of the animal because they're used for tearing in, typically into the juggler of the victim, of the prey, to make them bleed fast and die quickly so that they can eat them fresh while they're still fresh. Mm -hmm. And so, but then we have incisors. And what's your intuition about the incisors, especially when they match? Because uh, when I was a kid, I used to suck my thumb. And so my incisors, the upper incisors are pushing out and I never got the braces thing to push them back in place. But the incisors, which are the teeth up front, are supposed to match each other. And what do you think those are for? Think of what do you use to clip your nails? The nail clipper, right? So uh, it's for clipping and it's for clipping the grass, mm -hmm. for clipping vegetation and whatever other use, uh, evolutionary uh, advantage it had. But basically, in other words, the fact that we have a variety of shapes of teeth points also to a variety of foods 
a diversity of food, right? And the more diverse the food is, plants and animals and fungi, <laughs> okay, then the better chances for survival. Especially in an intermediate climate, say for example, what is the swath? Again, keep in mind that most of the continents are in what hemisphere, north or south? Northern hemisphere, right? Most of the continents, most of the land masses are in the Northern hemisphere. And of that Northern hemisphere, if you look at the continents themselves, starting with Asia, Siberia, Europe, North America, it's mostly a temperate zone, temperate. So temperate in general, we have the four seasons, the variety of the four seasons. Think of the Carolinas or someplace pretty like that. Now precisely making the transition from winter into spring, everything is springing forward, all the vegetation springing forward. Then we get the summer with the full lush growth of warmer, uh, more rainy season. And finally, eventually the fall where the leaves fall off and went to the winter time, harsh winter uh, where no leaves, therefore herbivores are hibernating and therefore carnivores have a difficulty surviving. So overall, the best overall adaptation for a large, broad, temperate region is to be an omnivore, omnivore, where we can eat plants and animals, whatever is available at the time, mm -hmm. even at the level of what we call hunter-gatherers, right? The primitive humans, think of the Flintstones, the hunter-gatherers. Mm -hmm. All right, so going back to the skulls that have been found and reconstructed through uh, computer imaging, we see that the diversion between the Hominini, the tribe of the Hominini and the tribe of the Godilini, which are going to be chimpanzees and gorillas, and the subspecies of the bonobo, right? What is the bonobo? Ever heard that term? Well, the bonobo, so these are contemporary, right? But the bonobo is uh, controversial. It turns out that the chimpanzee is actually a very aggressive animal, <laughs> very aggressive, especially the male, and the alpha male being the most aggressive. However, mm, which is an evolutionary trait because they have to survive in a tropical rainforest where there's all kinds of hunters <laughs> uh, on the chimp, right? And uh, <clears throat> But there is a species of the chimp uh, or a subspecies, a group that is called the bonobo. And it's called bonobo because it's a reference to bono or good, which uh, bono in Latin is good, bueno in Espanol, bueno. Because this is the good chimp. This is the chimp that is not aggressive, not as aggressive, right? And they are mostly arboreal. They tend to live more up on trees whereas the chimps live more on the ground. And because they live up on trees, they, their, uh, their aggression has diminished <laughs> over time, you know, and they're more benevolent, right? Because they tend to live more up in, in trees in tropical rainforests where there's an abundance of trees. And so they don't have to uh, fight as many predators. Mm -hmm. But it's anybody's uh, question if this is really, if it's going to be a separate species, if speciation has fully occurred or not. And now we can use, while well, I'm talking about the bottom one, the chimp, we can use the biological definition of Meyer. Remember the biological definition of Meyer, which is two characteristics, two individuals. They are of the same species. In these two individuals, obviously we're talking about mammals here, so it's sexual reproduction, a male and a female can, can identify each other as a mate, can actually mate. And you notice that that involves not only physiological characteristics, but also kind of psychological characteristics, instinct, you know, as male and female chimps, do we recognize each other as chimp? They're going to be stuff there that we don't see, but they see. For example, we see a great variety of faces in the human, right? Almost no two faces are alike unless they're identical twins. <laughs> and even those have some differences. But to me, one chimp looks like another chimp. The difference between male and female, 
right? Even though they have practically no dimorphism, remember the size, very different from the gorillas, where the female is small, tiny compared to the male, it's almost twice as large and biomass is at least twice as much. But the chimps, they all look alike to me, but themselves, they can tell each other, <laughs> all right? They can tell uh, each other apart from their faces, not to mention smells and other types of behaviors. I remember one time talking about programs from last century <laughs> with Dr. Plunkett. Uh, there's a program called Hawaii 5 -0. I don't know if it's still on or not. It was a drama series. You probably see it in the, what is that, the historical channel? <laughs> okay. But Hawaii 5 -0, I was a youngster and that was fun. It was thrilling to me to watch Hawaii 5 -0, right? So McGarrett was his name. I forget the name of the protagonist or the main actor, but he was a private detective. He was a, not private, he was a detective in the Hawaiian Islands, right? And so he had a sidekick and he was Western. In other words, he looked like uh, European humans, <laughs> what we call Aryan, <laughs> all right? But he had, his sidekick was a local who had much more Asiatic characteristics, Asian characteristics you know, the rounded face, the slanted eyes and so forth. I forget his name, but he was like the sidekick of uh, the, the main protagonist who was the main detective. And at one point they're trying to figure out a homicide scene and there's some mug shots or something. And the mug shots were all Western people, right? So the whole idea was that maybe it was a tourist as opposed to a native Hawaiian who had committed the crime, a tourist from the West or from Europe or from North America or maybe even Latin America. And in other words, a non-Hawaiian because of the face features. And so McGarrett shows these mock shots to his uh, associate who was like I say, Hawaiian, you know, and the, the it's amazing because it's been decades. It, that's at least, it goes back about, you know, 50 years since I saw the program with my brother and my parents. And I still remember the line of the fellow was, oh, gee, I don't know, because all you guys look the same to me. In other words, his Asiatic perspective, you know, it's probably exaggerated, but his Asiatic perspective is that we all look alike to him. <laughs> Whereas to us, maybe, Asiatic people look very, very similar, <laughs> you know, but themselves, they can recognize big distinctions among themselves, which we can't. So that's the same argument here. The chimpanzee and the bonobo, they could definitely tell each other apart from the behavior and from the location of their habitats. They don't mix, right? So they're not gonna mate, even though they look alike to us, you know, why is this male bonobo not mating with this female chimp or vice versa? Because they don't recognize each other. Is the chimp aggressive towards the bonobo? Yes, yes. exactly, because territory, right? And that has pushed the bonobos up there, <laughs> so they tend to stay up there. When the chimps, so these clans or pots, of, what, what name, I think they're called clans, uh, migrate around a little bit, then the other guys come down and forage and whatever. And then when the clan comes back of chimps, they go back up to trees, back up for It's interesting to watch their behavior. Anyway, so the divergence, the whole point here, the divergence at the level of tribe, right? The hominini versus the gorillini occur on the broad side between eight and five and a half or six million years ago. So an average of about seven million years ago was the divergence of these two tribes. Then we want to stick within the hominini line, right, tribe, to see, because what's gonna be the next level down, the next level down on the phylogenetics, remember class, order, family, genus, right? So the tribe is between family and genus. Now we're in the uh, tribe hominini, so we want to see the genera. In other words, one genus, several genera, right? Again, the added value of Latin. So here are the several genera, just in uh, broad 
uh, spectrum here. We'll get into more detail, starting with Sahelanthropus. Sahelanthropus, now the names are supposed to be informative. There are two ways of naming animals scientifically with the linear classification, the binomial classification. What I mean by binomial? Binomial is a reference to two, right? Two names, genus and species, Homo sapiens. That's a binomial. That's the standard classification uh, to this day, like I say, right? So the binomial classification is supposed to be informative and the tradition has stayed of Latin simply because at this point there are over 2 million of these classified and Latin is still, even though it's considered <coughs> excuse me, culturally a dead language in science and in the Vatican, it's still a live language, <laughs> Latin, because it's a common, it's a universal language. I remember when I was studying biology, when I was in your place, uh, well, at the bachelor's level in 1972 at FIU in the library, way before I went into the priesthood, uh, I discovered a science book, a biology book that was written in Latin. It was from the 60s. <laughs> it was only 10 years old back then, and it was all written in Latin. That's it. Yeah. So anyway, it's not that long ago. 50 years is not really that long in evolutionary time. <laughs> it's just a... It's, a uh, splash in the, what do you say? A flash in the pan. All right, so Sahelothropus, Sahelanthropus. The reference of when you see Thropus or um, uh, uh, Pithecus or Thropus, like anthropology, all right? The Thropus and the Pithecus, those are references to hominins, hominins, as opposed to or in contrast to the Gorillini, right? And then the, the front end of the word, uh, Sahelan, is a reference to the Sahel, the Sahel. Remember the Sahel is the border between the Sahara and equatorial Africa. Mm -hmm. Maybe instead of just talking, show your map. <laughs> uh, Sahel. Yes. So the Sahara is up here, Sahara, which is the desert part of Africa, the top part of Africa. Remember, the equator is down here, okay? It goes through here, equatorial Africa. And then in equatorial Africa, Congo, uh, Congo Basin is known as the Congo Basin. This region is a tropical rainforest, one of the two lungs of the world, right? The other lung being South America, the Amazon basin, hmm? the two big lungs of the world, which kind of coincides because the equator also goes through the Amazon basin <laughs> across the Atlantic. And so they kind of match. And in fact, the bulge of the bulge of uh, Brazil fits kind of in here, the dent of Africa, when we have plate tectonics and continental drift and uh, all that uh, movement of the crust of the earth. Anyway. The Sahel is a boundary between the Sahara and the tropical rainforest of uh, equatorial Africa. And the challenge about the Sahel is that this boundary is expanding. Of course, it cannot expand north because what's north of Africa? North of Africa happens to be the Mediterranean and north of the Mediterranean is Europe, okay? So the Sahara cannot expand beyond the coastline of Libya, Egypt, and Morocco, and all this region here. But the sands of the Sahara have actually been in Rome when the sands of the Sahara have drifted, have been blown across the Mediterranean and reached Mediterranean Europe, the coast of Europe. And periodically, every few years, uh, some of the sand of the Sahara comes through the Thailand Peninsula, and the sky turns very lightly yellowish, and the sunsets are spectacular because they're bright red sunsets. And that's sand from the Sahara, from Africa, blowing into Europe. <laughs> that has been happening over eons. Anyway, going south, there's this boundary, and the boundary is expanding, meaning that the Sahara gradually is moving south into the tropical rainforest of the Congo Basin, 
which is a big concern. It's a concern for climate, it's a concern for culture, many implications because it's very different uh, doing agriculture in uh, in fertile ground or doing agriculture in, in a desert, <laughs> okay? Anyway, that's the Sahel, it's the boundary. And why was I talking about that? Oh yes, Sahel Anthropus, there it is. So it's a reference that these uh, skulls, that these fossils have been found in that region. Okay. Now, the other alternative I mentioned, I, remember I mentioned two alternatives for naming scientific, uh, giving uh, uh, for taxonomy, for naming a species you, you happen to find and name a, a new species. You can always find a new species somewhere. Typically, they're gonna be microscopic at the bottom of the ocean, right? And that's what we haven't discovered about 80%, 80 to 90% of the species that live on Earth, species. But the others that we have discovered, and typically the scientist who discovers that species has a couple of alternatives. One alternative is to give it a name that is informative and significant, like the place, for example, where it was found, and the group of individuals that it belongs to, for example, they're anthropoids, so put anthropos or pithecus in there somewhere, or if they actually belong to the genus of the hominines, then put homo there, right? It's informative. The other alternative is to put your name on, on the creature, on the species. And that's an egotistical thing that has happened over years. And so we have some names that are attached to the scientific uh, classification of species. For example, our pine trees here, the slash pine that I talk so much about and I am so proud of, or forest of slash pine. The scientific name is Pinos, which is the genus, pine, right? It's Pinos, but the species name is Pinos elioti. And so who do you think discovered these pines a few centuries back? Mr. Elliot. <laughs> and so he called, oh, Pinos Elioti. <laughs> These are my pines. I discovered them. <laughs> because it's a distinction from the, uh, what is the one that looks uh, similar to it in Northern Florida? It's tall and splendidly like that. And it doesn't have a conical shape that the classical conifers, um, long pole, long pole pine, right? Very similar, but a different species. I forget the scientific name of long pole. A long palm pine is um, very similar to slash pine, but a different species. Anyway, uh, here we have the various homo genera, which have been discovered. Uh, there are a few more than these, but these are the main ones. But you see there's a transition starting at about 6 million years ago and moving toward the present. All right, so let's look at this branch of the hominini in greater detail. And by the way, I am switching gears from Meyer here. I've been using Meyer as the textbook for uh, evolution as a whole, because he was right into it. And in my opinion, it's one of the best textbooks for evolution or teaching evolution to this day, right? Uh, even though that edition is now no longer is exhausted. Uh, but now I'm switching here to uh, Barton and uh, et al, Barton and others, which is this one here. It's a more recent edition for the human, for the human. For the human. So here it is, the branching, starting at about 5 million years ago. And this is these are photos from uh, the text itself there, as you can see. Ardipithecus, there is the epithecine reference to human-like shape. Australopithecus, Australo is another informative name because Australio, where is, what continent do you know that has a name very similar to this one? Australia. Australia, Australia, Australo, okay. And is Australia in the Northern or the Southern hemisphere? Down there, getting close to uh, together with New Zealand, getting close to Antarctica, right? The South Pole. So Australia definitely in, this, in the Southern Hemisphere. So Australo 
is a reference to the Southern Hemisphere, right? The Southern Star, Australo, Australis, hmm? is, a, is a reference to Southern Hemisphere. So basically, Australopithecines are Southern Apes, Southern Apes. There's another one. There are a couple that are in the line, actually three, sorry, I take it back, beginning with uh, Australopithecus anamensis, then Australopithecus afarensis, and finally Australopithecus africanus. As if we didn't get it right before, you know, southern, but we're in the south in the continent of Africa. Because that is where <coughs> the genus Homo is um, presumed to have arisen, right? So it's what we say out of Africa, the human species out of Africa, from Africa. So the common ancestor there with the Australopithecine line, which is Southern apes in general, is gonna be Australopithecus africanus about two and a half million years ago. So we're getting closer. We went from about <clears throat> 6 million years ago, the branching with the other uh, main um, great apes of our time, orangutan, gorilla, chimpanzee, And now within the 6 million, further break between the northern or the southern uh, great apes with Australopithecus about 2.5 million years ago, the branch of Homo. Now, <clears throat> you heard about the missing link. Well, there are many missing links, right, between one species and another because there is an actual continuum. Again, the argument of Darwin that he preferred to talk about varieties rather than species because it's emphasizing variety is the name of the game. What game? The game of evolution because selection is hammering down on variation. Right? That's why I cover variation first and then selection, because the best adapted, the best variation within of, a, of an individual within that species is the one that has the better chance of survival, especially when there are changes, climatological changes or other changes, right? And therefore, uh, <clears throat> there are, if we look at speciation as a gradual event, until eventually these individuals will not be able to recognize uh, other individuals that look very similar to them, maybe at least to our eyes, but they don't really recognize each other, then there's a good possibility that if that continues to play forward, because now they're only mating within that group, which look similar to the other group, but they're not intermating, then there is a possibility of eventually full speciation, where they will never mate when they're put together, the two groups. So <clears throat> the, the missing link that we have been hearing about for decades uh, in human evolution, right, would be here at the branching from Australopithecus africanus, which is the fossil that has been found closest to us uh, in the Homo, line about two and a half million years ago and then we get a branching on one side is homo habilis and again informative because habilis is what that he's able that he's able to do he's able to do with his hands basically it's a reference to using the hands all right homo habilis homo rudolfensis on the other hand is Rudolf, the name, okay? So that's the alternative naming there. Then ergaster, ergaster means erect, erect, which is there's a branching from ergaster into erectus. So these, all right, so there's a nuance in the verb here of erectus is already the noun of being erect. In other words, fully bipedal, walking on two, whereas ergaster is rising, rising, maybe had more of a curvature on the upper, you know, that our spinal cord is an S shape, but if the two curves of the S are not 
equal to each other or symmetrical, right? Then the body is either gonna hunch forward or hunch backwards, <laughs> or the hip is gonna come out backwards. So uh, in our gaster, it could be that the upper curve of the S of our spinal cord was slightly larger and therefore hunching forward somewhat, all right? It's an awkward position because then the full weight of the body does not fall totally on top of the hips and therefore on top of the hind legs, as I'll show you a dagger in a minute, but maybe someone hunched over. Anyway, from Ergaster, eventually we get Heidelbergensis, and Heidelbergensis is a reference to another place, which is the today the town of Heidelberg in Germany. Mm -hmm. Obviously back then, Germany or that region of Northern Europe was not named Germany and the town was not there yet, okay? Because we didn't have sapiens, but Heidelbergensis is a significant fossil that was found in that part of region, uh, what it, which is today uh, Germany, kind of continental Europe, Northern continental Europe. <laughs> you see that Heidelberg, uh, Neanderthal branched off from there. And in fact, Neanderthal seem to have been very successful in Europe, mm -hmm. were adapted to the point of having clothing, which is a very important cultural characteristic for the development of our species. And finally, sapiens, both branching out of Heidelbergensis. So this common ancestor between sapiens and Neanderthal is significant for us. Look at this, about half a million years ago. Okay. And look at the coexistence of sapiens and Heidelbergensis is shown in this graph at the very end here until Heidelbergensis, I'm sorry, Neanderthal doesn't make it to time zero, in other words, the present. Mm -hmm. But very close, very close. To the point that we not only have fossil record from Neanderthals, we actually have tissue, soft tissue some of it, mm -hmm. and therefore the DNA analysis has been done. And therefore when you do your phylogenetics in 23andMe or whatever that thing is called, Spotify, whatever, you find a, you're gonna find a small percentage of Neanderthal in each one of us. <laughs> and how do they figure that out? Not from a dry bone that's mineralized from soft tissues, mm -hmm. maybe the pulp of uh, teeth and so forth and other parts of the body some little bit of skin that was left on the skull, <laughs> scalp on the skull. All right. In part because of the, wet, of the cold climate and this winterization of the world, right? And the ice ages that kind of preserve natural freezer of some of these cadavers of, uh, of Neanderthals that fell uh, in different parts of Europe. <clears throat> All right. Now, the back to the whole issue of uh, the tribe of hominin. Again, <clears throat> tribe in the anthropological sense, not in the cultural sense. Uh, so remember that a number of words are not univocal. What do I mean by univocal? As they don't have a single meaning, they have to be seen in context. For example, if I say bear, what am I talking about? Just bear. Am I talking about the, the bear in the woods, you know, the grizzly bear, the brown bear, the black bear, the polar bear, Ursus? Or am I talking about to bear a burden, to carry a burden? <laughs> well, it depends, right? Or am I talking about bear to strip, for example, become bear, <laughs> okay? I don't know until I put it in context. So you don't know until I put bear, the word in, in context. So the same, when, I, when we say that this is a tribe, the hominin, the hominini, that tribe is in anthropological sense, but not culturally, because today people talk about tribes, for example, to this day, racial tribes that exist in Africa. There's a tribal system underneath, layered underneath the different nations, the contemporary nations of Europe, which, how many nations in Europe? Anybody know? since we're talking about Europe, well, here they are, are in Africa. Here they are. You start, each one of these is a nation, right? It's a country. 
free, independent, etc. When you put them all together, there are about 50 countries in Europe. It's a continent that has the largest number of nations in the world, because there are only about 200 countries in the whole world. So one fourth of all the countries of the world are in only one continent of the seven continents that we have. So anyway, uh, underneath this system, modern system of countries and nations and so forth, with more or less democracies and parliamentary systems, etc. Underneath that layer, culturally, at the level of the people, you have a tribal system that doesn't match these boundaries, these political, this is called political geography, as opposed to natural geography, this is natural geography, right? But this is political geography where we take a continent and subdivide it according to territories, political territories of the nations and countries. Well, the tribal system, territories do not match geography, do not match these boundaries. And it's there. And I can tell you because I live, for example, I'm in residence at a parish nearby that is called St. Monica Parish. And it's a Catholic church that is in the neighborhood of Miami Gardens. And there's a large percentage of African-Americans in, in this community of Miami Gardens where our university is. And Africans, not just African-Americans, but Africans who live here. Nigeria, Congo, you name it. In fact, uh, the pastor of St. Monica Parish, Father Samuel, is from Nigeria. <laughs> Okay, and we're talking all the time about the cultural stuff that is occurring there and the conflicts that are occurring underneath, below the uh, the political systems of the time, mm -hmm. uh, because there's a tribal system there, but that's a cultural tribe that has nothing to do with the classification of hominini, because all of these cultural tribes in Europe in Africa and in other parts of the world, like Asia, for example, etc., they're all human. They're all Homo sapiens. All right, they're all Homo sapiens. There may be uh, physiological characteristics, but that uh, that is just uh, let's say appearance, because in principle, any African man may be able to mate with where do you want to put them? Uh, Northern Scandinavia to make the contrast, <laughs> all right? And vice versa with a Northern Scandinavian woman and a Northern Scandinavian man in principle is able to mate and uh, with an African woman. And the second characteristic, which I left a pending of a biological species, produce offspring who are fertile, right? So we have to wait until those offspring grow and themselves, uh, uh, mate and procreate to see if they produce fertile offspring and so forth. So it's a long-term thing, depending on the species, of course. But my point is that in principle, therefore, the human species is just about the only species where there is only one population in the whole world. Only one population, which is a contemporary phenomenon of travel, the, the capacities to travel. But being able to travel has allowed us, and I'm talking mostly airplane, but it can be by boat also if you want, or within a continent by bicycle or walking or whatever you wanna, where you wanna travel, you would take the train, you can take the train. But the point is that in principle, any male human is capable, as long as the male human is fertile, of course, and the female the human is also fertile, to produce fertile asteroids throughout the whole world. And so, at least biologically, we're considered one, one population, okay? One population. Anyway, back to um, the homini, then, hominins. We find uh, here is what I was mentioning before, the fossil record of the skull, what has been found, put together, and uh, reconstructed, again, with uh, computer imaging. Some are quite complete, but others, for example, Australopithecus was uh, only the back half. <laughs> this is what was found, and this was reconstructed, or vice versa, I'm not really sure. But this is reconstructing the skull and then putting, 
like I mentioned, the layers of muscle, adipose tissue, and finally skin on that skull to see what they would look like. So the upper images here with the black background, those are photographs. But the lower images here, these are photographs, but they're photographs of a model, okay? Because we don't have soft tissue from four to two million years ago, much less six to four or seven to six million years. But here you see the transition beginning with Cephalanthropus all the way to Australopithecus, the Australopithecus. Again, Southern apes. And you can see in broad strokes how the face, just what is known as the countenance, the facial features, right, of the rounded face, more or less rounded, with the eyes, nose, mouth, three main anatomical characteristics that are very distinct in the human, including the ridge of the eyebrow, all right? You can see a gradual transition just in these three reconstructions from ape-like to human-like. If you take the first and the last, you see there, from the models, from the fossil record. So it's quite interesting. Okay, let's go uh, back to the skulls for a moment and look at greater detail mm, of this uh, now in the hominini line. In that now we're here we're at the level of genus already, homo, homo. Okay, so remember we started with habilis, rudolfensis, then. Ergaster, from Ergaster to Erectus. The dots are the missing links that have not been found in uh, the fossil record yet. But here is a theoretical node. Here's another theoretical node. And then antecessor, there's very little, too little record to actually make a reconstruction of that. For whatever reason, the experts know better. Until eventually we get the Heidelbergensis, which is squarely in the middle of Europe. When you think of Germany today, continental Europe, as opposed to the British Isles and Ireland, which all that, which is the uh, is the island uh, uh, Europe. Okay, so let's look at a uh, map with some names. So here's continental Europe, uh, north of Africa, and northwest of Asia. This one doesn't have it here. This one is a political map. Uh, Germany, here's Germany. It's pretty much in what we call Western Europe, right? Not Eastern Europe but Western Europe right here, the Northern part of Western Europe of continental Western Europe is Germany. And so Heidelberg within that. And from Heidelberg, Heidelbergensis, both Neanderthal and Sapiens, all right? So this means that we did not come from the Neanderthals and the Neanderthals did not come from us, but rather we have a common ancestor, which hypothetically for now is Heidelbergensis. And this is based mostly on the skull size and the, the, the fact that the skull becomes more and more flattened on the surface and the cranium larger and larger brain capacity so in the end, when you compare the skull size of us and the endothars with back here, we have at least twice as much skull size or theoretically brain capacity than the first homo, like homo habilis, for example, twice as much, you can see it. Okay, let's uh, continue. 
when we do the fuller mapping of HOMO, now we're at the level of genus, right? HOMO, starting with Habilis, Rudolfensis, Agaster, Erectus, Adelbergensis, and Neanderthal. Notice I've left human, uh, sapiens out for now, but just ancestors. Ancestors, we line them up, these six, with their skulls. These are actual photos of the skulls in whatever museums or institutes they're located throughout the world, all right? Reconstructed as much as possible. So staying with the skull, compare the two extremes from Habilis to Neanderthalis. You see how the brow, the mo one of the most distinct features of development is the brow, the huge, this is known as the, uh, I think it's the orbital ridge, the orbital ridge. Why is it the orbit? What is the orbit? The orbit is a socket of the eyeball, where the eyeball goes into the skull, that's called the orbit, okay? Because the, the eye orbits around there, looks around <laughs> from inside. It's a protection for the eye, of course. And so the orbital ridge is the bone component of the eyebrow behind the, the actual eyebrow hair, okay? And uh, <clears throat> you notice from the most pronounced to the least pronounced with Heidelbergensis. Mm -hmm. And the various steps in between. Anyway, uh, also the jaw is a shame because Habilis would have a larger jaw like rural fences, which is mm, compared to Heidelbergensis, for example, smaller jaw. And the general thinking of this with regards to the jaw getting, especially the lower jaw getting smaller, right? It's a transition from mostly vegetarian uh, food regimen to an omnivore, truly uh, a variety of vegetables and animals, but more and more the hunter the hunter of uh, Neanderthal, to the point that Neanderthal, there are a number of weapons that Neanderthal developed, which are also there part of the fossil record in a sense, because mostly different varieties of spears and, and arrow heads that are on the ground lying next to the skull or next to the skeleton of uh, Neanderthals scattered mostly throughout Europe, okay? So the recession of the jaw gradually but surely can also indicate a change in diet to are more hunting and less vegetarian. All right, uh, let's uh, look at skull size for a moment because this is what I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the lecture the difference between maximizing and optimizing a trait or a characteristic, all right? And maximizing means this. Maximizing is that continue to add features uh, to it indefinitely. So for example, in principle, a bigger wing can make for a bigger bird, right? In principle, a bigger wing because the bird, then the, the wing can sustain in flight a bigger bird. Maximizing that would be uh, that would be maximizing that the bigger the wing, the bigger the bird, or the bigger the wing, the bigger the plane. Also, maximizing is that, but optimizing is different. Optimizing is that there is an ideal shape, there's an ideal size of wing, beyond which it actually becomes a detriment to the animal or to the, uh, the artifact. So in the case of birds, sticking with that example, it could be that at some point, the wing is just so large that no body mass can actually hold that wing in flight. And so if the wing actually gets bigger, 
the animal would not get bigger. The animal would actually die, get eaten up or something, and would not survive. And so that's an example of optimizing. So there's an optimal size of wing. We can make a similar case with uh, uh, flight, with artifacts, with the airplanes. It could be, I don't know this for sure, but it could be that in principle, the larger the wing, the larger the plane, but there comes a point where that wing is so large that no motor, no fuel can actually keep that wing flying afloat. And so at that point is no longer maximal, but it's optimal. In other words, beyond that size of wing, if we make a larger wing, that contraption will not take off, will not fly, <laughs> right? So that's an optimization. There's an optimal size of wing, beyond which it's actually detrimental. So that's the distinction between maximum, maximization and optimization. Why am I prefacing this? Because you would think that the larger the, so first there's a presupposition here that the larger the skull, which is the bone, right? The skull, which is a fossil record, it's safe to assume that the larger the skull, the larger the brain within, right? In other words, we're not gonna find a, a little brain inside the large skull. There's a lot of empty space there <laughs> of what, fluid? No. So the larger the skull of the creature, of the species, of the mammal, in principle, the larger the brain inside also. Hmm? That's the assumption. And so <clears throat> when we compare, for example, pantroglodytes, which is the modern chimp, okay? So there's a little bit of an anachronism here because they're comparing a modern chimp skull with fossil record of the homo line. Mm -hmm. So uh, the chimp, the modern chimp has about 40, uh, 400 cubic centimeters, 400 cubic centimeters of uh, brain size. Mm -hmm. Now this doesn't say anything about the details either. The gyri and sulci, in other words, all the convolutions of the brain, the gray matter, on the surface of the brain, which is where the thought process occurs. That says nothing, the, you know, the skull says nothing really about the convolution of that brain, how convoluted it is or not. Mm -hmm. But again, we assume that there's an association between larger brain and more convolutions, also more uh, folding in and out, and therefore more overall surface of the gray matter of the brain for thought process or higher function of, of the brain, yeah. higher function, capacity. Right, so from pantrogladitis of uh, 400 cubic centimeters, 500 cubic centimeters in habilis, remember Homo habilis is one of the oldest ones, two and a half million years ago. So the genus Homo, is said to have started uh, around 3 million, between 3 and 2 million years, more or less. Okay. So Habilis is right smack in the middle of that at 2.5 million years ago, transitional. But about 100 cc's more than, than the current chimp, the current Gorillini. Then, uh, there's a jump from habilis to erectus of almost or doubling the size from 500 to 1000 cc's, all right, cubic centimeters or, yeah. Then when we look at Neanderthal and Sapiens, we see that we current have 1355, this is a pretty robust number. 1350, if you want to round it up a little bit. Uh, 1,300, uh, 1,350 uh, cubic centimeters of the average adult brain. And this is a pretty robust number. Why do I say it's a robust number? Well, no, within, within Homo sapiens. How many millions of skulls do you think have been measured, you know, could have been measured to come to this average adult brain size, right? 
quite a few throughout the world over the decades and even centuries. So that's why I say it's a pretty robust number. The sample size is huge, at least compared to Neanderthal. I mean, how many skulls of Neanderthal have been measured? I have no clue, but I know it's not in the millions. <laughs> Probably they, I, I don't even know, I should know this, but I don't even know how many Neanderthals were actually existing by the time they were wiped out, you know, to what population size they got, I don't know. But certainly we, we haven't sampled all of the population because we haven't found all of the skeletons. It's, it's, uh, it's logical to assume that we haven't found all of the endothermal skeletons that may have lived uh, in their time, okay? But I don't know, it may be a few dozen. I don't know if it even reaches 100. But they come up with 15, 12. What does that mean? They have at least 150 cc's more brain than we do. Brain capacity, anyway. Their skull is larger. That's the whole point. Their skull is larger. You can see it here, right? Their skull is actually larger, presumably housing a larger brain than the human. Now, again, the caveat here is that we don't know about the convolutions. It could have been a larger brain, but a smoother brain <laughs> with not as many convolutions and there were therefore not, not as much thought process. Mm -hmm what sometimes people call colloquially a brute, a brute, large person, but not, uh, not too intelligent. Well, the skull was also concomitantly larger than the human, not just the skeleton as a whole. So even though they had a larger skull and therefore presumably a larger brain capacity, we wiped them out. So this is a perfect example of maximization, uh, not maximization, but optimization. They actually have a larger brain, but that brain larger than the, than the sapiens brain was not smarter to outsmart the, the sapiens. Otherwise they would be living today and we would be extinct. <laughs> and it's the other way around. Okay, it's the other way around. And so, and again, because they coexisted in Europe back to about uh, as close as 20,000 years ago, how do we know that? That Neanderthal and Sapiens coexisted in Europe up until about 20,000 years ago. How do we know that? The fossil record, the skulls, the, the skeletons are all there, right? That's where they have been found. And dating them chronologically with uh, isotopes, et cetera, like we covered before, the carbon-14 thing. All right, so, and we can tell that these are the two averages, even though one number is more robust than the other one. But we see that the average Neanderthal skull is definitely larger than human, and yet we wipe them out. Applying the competitive exclusion principle, at some point, the more fit species is going to displace the less fit species to the point of actually wiping them out, not just secluding them to another region <laughs> where they could have existed. We could have had two species of homo living today. Neanderthals could have been living around today, but they're not nowhere to be found. Not yet anyway. <laughs> hmm? Okay, so uh, I want to caution you about one thing though, especially about the fossil record. As many of these skulls that have been found, we're making a lot of assumptions here. And, I, and these, by the way, are CTs. These are computer tomographs. I'm gonna to show you another set here. Let's go there. Because what is the big assumption here? And especially in the fossil skulls, which would be these four here, right? The fossil skulls, because chimp is existing today, sapiens is existing today, but these four fossils, the big assumption is that these are representative skulls of that species, that they are the average skull, but nothing is said that we are actually finding the average individual. We could have found the individual that happened to be the tallest or the shortest, right? 
uh, uh, the one who had greater anomalies, why is it, why should we assume that the fossil that we found is the average individual of that species, whatever species it is? We can't assume that because again, paucity, you know, it's only one individual. The more we find and the more they look alike, we can estimate an average between all of them. But nothing is said that the fossils that we find are the average, or right smack in the middle of the average of the individuals who live at that time. Remember variation, remember the, assuming that there's a standardized curve also here, that it's a normalized curve, the standard distribution. And this is what I wanted to point out, for example, of the human skull today. Again, these are CTEs of human skulls today. Now, are all these four skulls here in various views, do they belong to four different species? They're all sapiens, right? And yet look at the variation in skull shapes. It's amazing. I mean, compare these two from an occipital view. This is known as the foramen magnum, this hole here. This goes into the brain stem, right? And then the brain stem comes out from here and forms the spinal cord. <laughs> so the next bone that is matching up to the foramen magnum, <laughs> the, the large, the great hole, the, the grand hole, hole, foramen is hole, and magnum is the grand hole of the skull. What matches this? So this would be at the bottom of the skull, right? And what is at the bottom? What bone matches that? The first the one. The first vertebra, the first cervical vertebra, which is called the atlas, right? The atlas. And because the skull has to rotate on top of it about 180 degrees from side to side, more or less. The older we get, the less we rotate. <laughs> The atlas is kind of flat on top, but the other, all the vertebrae interlock with each other. Hmm? They have processes that make them articulate. Anyway, compare the foramen magnum looks kind of similar for all four. And that's just about the one characteristic that looks most alike, that there's less variation in the four skulls. From then out, around, out and about, around the skull, going from the bottom up, there's variation all over the place. Look at how the cheekbones protrude here and not here. And somewhat here and somewhat more here, but very different protrusions, right? Uh, I don't know. These two guys have kind of a pyramid on top of their heads. And these much less pronounced. This one is more flat now. This guy looks very sad. This one looks very inquisitive, just from the orbit, from the socket. <laughs> this one is between sad and inquisitive, and this guy looks surprised. <laughs> if you start putting <laughs> tissues on it <laughs> and backing out. Of, but this is a skull, which is immovable, right? And then the side lateral view is just amazing. Look, maybe this guy fucks his thumb a lot. <laughs> I don't know. But these are more flat and others thumb sucker here, <laughs> probably got a, a uh, basketball on his face <laughs> when he was born or something, or she was born, <laughs> totally flat face. I'm making a joke out of it, but you see the variety, variation of individuals with the same, same species, all adults. Hmm? So who, who is representative of the average skull size? It depends what skeleton. If we find this skull, we say, oh, this is a representative. Doesn't have to be. Maybe this is more common. Who knows? But these are certainly four, four striking varieties, variations on the human skull. We can apply that same uh, thinking to any fossil that we find. Okay, So we say caveat emptor, buyer beware. We should put variations within these skulls, make them somewhat similar, somewhat different, to more adequately represent the species. My whole point about that is that really, if we were to do this 
in a more accurate way, let's say we use this as the norm, but then we would vary, vary the fractions, the fractions a little bit to make them look similar, but not identical. So maybe give me one that looks a little more ape-like and one that looks a little more human-like and make that same argument consistent so that we have three individuals of the same species. And maybe we're getting closer to reality there. I don't know, but right? Uh, when we want to see a transition from ape-like to human-like, we would like to see more variety within the facial features of each one of these representatives. Okay, let's move forward. Again, question, comments, stop me anytime, right? Coming close to the break here. I'll tell you, we're gonna probably break after this. Yeah, because we're gonna go into bipedalism. All right, so skull size. Again, I want to show to you graphically by the numbers, quantitatively, how this issue of optimizing versus maximizing plays out. If you look at the little dots, a little small, yeah, you can see them on the screen. The little figures um, here, so here is the, uh, here is the key of interpretation, all right? The most obvious one is the open circles, the red open circles, which represents anatomically modern human represented by sapiens the open red circles on the graph. See, we have, it's the most abundant, right? It's the most, it's the one that we have the most robust sample size. Then the closed circle, Heidelbergensis and Neanderthal, closed circles. Erectus uh, from Asia is the closed triangles or solid triangles, solid squares, are African solid squares. Here are solid squares. Open squares. Further down, of course, the chronology here, the x-axis typically is the independent classes is of time, starting from about two and a half million years ago, the rise of Homo as a genus, Homo, from two and a half million years forward from the fossil record. Of course, on the vertical axis, my bad, I should have mentioned this earlier, vertical axis is brain size by cubic centimeters all the way up to 2000 mm -hmm. from 400, which is the baseline. So open triangle, habilis. And finally, Paranthropus, which is a southern ape, Australopithecus, Australopithecine, not on the Homo line, Right, but on the Paranthropus, on the Thropus line, is yellow, mm. yellow square, way down here, and it's a yellow because it's not a Homo, it's a Paranthropus. This is the genus species, the genus name. So, for comparison, because this kind of establishes the baseline between four and five hundred cc's. Okay, now look at the slope. Each, each figure, each little uh, figure, mm, datum, is representative of a skull, of a fossil skull. And so when we have three or more of them, it's a good thing because then we can develop a slope. Some slopes are more robust than others, again, depending on the number of individuals. But the point is that when you look at slopes from one through five, Right? One, two, three, four, five. The slopes are the slopes of the various categories. Again, beginning with Paranthropus, the solid yellow squares. See the slope, right? Then number two is Habilis. They are the open triangles. Number three is... Um, Africanus, the open squares is actually uh, this line five. Okay. Asian is four. 
So these are reverse here. You look at all five slopes before six. And you, what kind of, a, is it a positive or a negative slope? From one through five, see the numbers here pointing to the slope. The slope is a gray line, it's the best fit through individual points. Points meaning the fossils that have been found belonging to that genus. From one through five, you see five slopes. Are those slopes positive or negative? Definitely. Now look at slope six. Slope six is negative, right? In other words, there is a, with time, with time, there is a gradual but real statistical diminishing of brain capacity of skull size in cubic centimeters, starting from about 100,000 years ago to the present. Now this is a wide scatter for sure, but this is the statistical slope done by the computer analysis, right? Of all the white circle, the, the open circles, which represent anatomical modern human from about 100,000 years ago to the, per, to, the crest, to the present, we have actually lost brain capacity. In other words, primitive sapiens, primitive sapien skulls of about 100,000 years ago had a larger brain capacity than us. But they're fossils. In other words, they're, they didn't survive. That brain capacity was not desired trait. The smaller brain capacity was a more desired trait, only by 150 cc's, but enough to make us survive and become by far the dominant species, the most dominant species on the planet, okay? So this is very interesting that this slope is negative based on the numbers on the fossil record. And you can see that the open circles are the largest number of data in this table, right? So again, that slope is the most robust of all of these slopes. <laughs> so speculation, you think about it, going back to this uh, other thing here, I mentioned that this large hole is the foramen, foramen magnum, right? And that the skull sits on top of the spinal cord, the vertebrae, and that is a like a column. It's like the capital of a column. But it turns out that the column is not straight vertical. We don't have a rigid spinal cord. What is the anatomical shape, the structure of the thing, of the spinal cord? S-curve. Yes, S-curve. S-curve. First, curving backwards, and then curving forward. Right? Did I get it right? Yeah. Until it lands on the... Uh, hip, and then the hip displaces the weight laterally down to the femur, down to the legs. Two legs, two, two, two columns. But the one column and the narrow part, which is precisely at the level of the abdomen, is like an hourglass. It's a delicate spot, and that's typically where the problems become the back pain problems. The back problems is where? The lumbar region, precisely the lumbar region, okay? So this, um, how is it that the larger brain was selected out? You would think that the larger brain is the maximum, is the best, but no. There was an optimal sized brain is what I'm trying to say. Beyond which it was a disadvantage. It was a survival handicap. So selection, which is merciless and relentless, hammered down on the larger brain. How can that be? Well, because of bipedalism. <laughs> it could be, now it's speculative, but it could be that the larger brain actually is too heavy to carry around, especially when we have to flee the 
the enemy, the tiger or whatever is chasing us, you know, the selective pressure. So a, lot, a smaller brain allows for a more agile structure, a more agile skeleton to carry that brain. In other words, there was an optimal size of skeleton according to a constant, which, which applies, there's a constant on earth that is so obvious that we obviously miss it. What is a constant to which all species on earth are subject to? And it's a dragging constant that is there day and night. Yes, gravity. And gravity applies to all of us and applies in proportion to mass, right? Because mass times gravity gives us the weight. So the more an individual weights, the weighs, the harder it is to get away from the enemy, from the tiger that's just right behind me. <laughs> so a more agile skeleton was actually a survival advantage, survival fitness, beyond bipedal, beyond bipedal. Okay? And so that's a speculation. Neanderthal, because of the bigger brain, was not agile enough to outmaneuver uh, sapiens. In a contest, it had to be practically hand-to-hand -hand because there were no long range. I don't know exactly if the ball had been invented yet, but most likely not. It was basically a spear thing, right? So it was close contact fighting between sapiens and Neanderthal fighting for the same mammoth. So someone killed the mammoth, but now someone has to eat the mammoth, right? And you got sapiens, you have a clan of sapiens and a clan of, of Neanderthal fighting with each other to see who's gonna eat the mammoth <laughs> and close contact. And so it could be that the sapiens with a smaller brain outcompeted the Neanderthal speculation, but it's making sense, right? So this segues into bipedalism. So what did I have here in writing? Okay, so this is kind of a little summary up until now, which is uh, from going back to the tribe of the Hominini. There are at least six extinct uh, uh, homo species that we know today, right? Namely, these guys. And some people, depending on how you classify them, it could actually be double number, up to 12 different homo, which are not sapiens, which are extinct because they're not around today, right? All right. And uh, the main characteristic is being fully bipedal, which frees the hands precisely for an, a substantial increase in survival. Mm -hmm. Bring up the forward hands. And uh, the main synergy that occurs there is between the brain and the hand for making tools and also for harnessing fire, for harnessing fire, which was again, another big leap, a quantum leap in the evolution of uh, the human uh, genus and eventually us. All right, so I'm gonna stop there for now and going into bipedalism and how that may have evolved, okay? So this is a nice little break. And like I mentioned, during the break now, go and take a look at our Croesus relative, just a skeleton, not a Croesus relative, which is in the vitrina. How do you say vitrina, the, the glass box, all right? Glass showcase over there, just coming out to your right. Uh, that is a skeleton of a pantaglodytes, which is the chimp. Hmm? Okay, let me pause recording for the break. Okay, folks, welcome back. Now we're going into the second half of uh, today's lecture. We left off with bipedalism. So here are the skeleton of the chimp and the skeleton of the human. And the black cross is the center of gravity of these two bodies, all right? These two species, these two skeletons. Keep in mind, again, the basic principle, form follows function. 
the structure of the thing is according to the function of the thing and the fact that we have an internal skeleton precisely to hold up our body mass against gravity, which is a constant pulling everything on Earth, around the Earth, toward the center, grounding us, literally. Mm. But then, then there is the burden, if you will, of moving the body mass, right? Because body mass times gravity gives us our weight, which we have to carry our weight around, literally. You notice that the chimp is what is known as knuckle walking, knuckle walking. First of all, notice that the forearms, F-O-R-E, the forward limbs, are longer, much longer than the hind limbs, then, right? Than the hind legs. But actually, it's still four legs because they have a type of walk that is called knuckle walking. Knuckle walking, they walk literally on the knuckles of the hands. And they can stand upright and walk for a while in two legs on, on their hind legs, but only for a little while, because after a while they get tired and they have to come down on all four. They come down on their forward limbs, on their knuckles. Uh, knuckle walking. Right? And that's typical of the Gorillini, which here is the gorilla, very distinct way of walking. Here is the chimps. Mm -hmm. They do this kind of uh, walk, knuckle walking. So they can stand upright for a while, but for us, it would be very awkward to walk that way. Mm -hmm. And see uh, one that is uh, upright. Uh, it's trying to. Oh, it's going to show all the knuckle walking all the time. I'm trying to look for a chimp who's standing up. Um, Is the chimp is the closest to us phylogenetically. All right. We know that they can stand upright, but at some point they have to go down on all fours. Okay? They cannot walk on their hind legs indefinitely. And why do you think that is? Again, the hint of the structure and the function. Look at our spinal cord and look at our, our spinal cord. We have that S, right? That slight S here. The pinching in in the abdomen, abdominal region, the lumbar region of the spinal cord. But theirs is basically one big arch. They don't have that S. And so the center of gravity is displaced off the hips, and that's why they can get up on their hips for a while, but after a while, it's awkward, it's tiring, and they have to calm down again, you know, so knuckle walking. So obviously that restricts their walking, and that essentially ties up their hands, mostly for walking, as opposed to freeing them up indefinitely, because in principle, as long as we have enough energy, we can walk indefinitely. Right? Stay on our two legs. And it's not that we get we get tired for running out of ATPs, if you will, on, on, the, uh, on the circulatory system, but it's not because of the structure itself. It's just a metabolic thing. So this transition to bipedalism, which happened before Homo, in other words, by the time Homo arose, we were already bipedal, okay? In other words, Australopithecines were already bipedal. And uh, that's something that I think I need to do better here and illustrate going back 
that even some Australopithecines were already bipedal. There is a famous skeleton of Lucy. I don't know if you've heard of Lucy, right? So Lucy was a little lady like this, the adult was about half our size. And uh, where is the, I looked it up earlier just to have it. Here she is. Look at the skeleton of Lucy. Okay, so she is an Australopithecus afarensis. Right? Australopithecus afarensis, which puts her here. Definitely a southern ape, Australopithecine. So she's here three and a half million years ago, a million years, clearly a million year before Homo, one whole million year before Homo. Uh, the earliest fossil of Homo that we have, right? So she's definitely not human. She's a hominid and she's from the tribe of the hominids, but she's not a, a Homo. She's not a Homo in the genus. She's an Australopithecine. She's a Southern ape. And she was named Lucy affectionately when this was discovered. This is the leaky family who have done a lot of work in the Great Rift Valley of Equatorial Africa. First, let me put it in place. So these, uh, many of these skeletons and skulls and fossils have been found in what is known as the Great Rift Valley. Great Rift Valley. The Great Rift Valley is in Africa, as you can see here, in what is known as the Horn of Africa, right? Let me show you. Just pull out these two slides. Here's Africa, and this is the Great Rift Valley here, which kind of is like a like a J shape, and it goes around Lake Victoria and the other lakes that we saw. Remember Lake uh, Turkana and Lake Tanganyika when we saw the cichlid evolution, the the fish. Hmm? That's the region here, and the Great Rift Valley is uh, one of the richest, the richest regions of the world for fossils, for the fossil record, especially for the hominids, okay? And it's near what is known as the Horn of Africa. This is the, the Horn of Africa, this portion here of uh, Western, uh, Eastern Equatorial Africa, today Ethiopia, that region there. Here's Lake Victoria, Burkana, Tanganyika, and this crack, there's a crack because there are two plates there's a, there are actually this conversion of three plates. There's one plate here, which I think is the Indian plate, but I'm not sure. There's the African plate. And then there's the plate of the Arabian Peninsula. So this crack here is literally a crack on the surface of the earth. And it looks like that. This is an actual photograph. Okay. So this area is very rich with fossils human and non-human. And so there's a lot of uh, research going in this area to this day. It's a region that is geologically active and very studied and has been mapped. And uh, you see these sheer uh, walls here have been dated, right, etc. So studied a lot. Well, when we look at that area of the Great Rift Valley, that's where Lucy was found. And this is, this is what they found, okay? This is what they found. And from this, they put together this, <laughs> which is just amazing. It's amazing what they can do. But uh, anyway, uh, here she is and is, uh, here's one comparing. This is, a, this is a good comparison. I always make this mistake of clicking the last photo. Well, okay, so it's a two minute thing. Maybe we can watch, hold it. All right, Let's go back to the beginning. Yeah. So it's gonna show 
the the walking the gate you know what the gate is not g a t e but g a i t I think it is gate here's another word yeah the el paso you know that no the steps between our feet left foot right foot if you walk on the sand that's called the gate right and how the skeleton moves shifting forward and sideways to maintain the balance on two feet as opposed to four mm -hmm. so let's go mm -hmm. gating so here it's going to present Chimp and Lucy, in other words, knuckle walking and bipedal. Right? So even the range of vision, notice how the, the head can move much more. OK, there's Chimp getting up on, uh, on their hind legs. Very awkward moving. The arms actually are hitting against the hip. And eventually he gets tired and has to come down on four legs again. <laughs> right? Now comparing Lucy with the human, with sapiens. The cervical, cervical vertebrae, we have cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. The hip is very little displaced, basically is is taking the weight from the upper body and distributing it to the lower body, to the two columns, which are the legs, articulated, of course, feet flat on the ground, and moving forward, again, with the articulation of the toes, which, by the way, uh, oh, it stopped already. Mm. At some point, someone asked me, uh, well, why do we keep, oh, hold on, it's going to, show all three together. Before we go there, I just want to show and uh, notice the difference on the toes of the chimp compared to Lucy and us, all right? Because the prehensile, look at the toe, look at the big thumb, the big toe of the chimp is known as prehensile, right? It opposes the other for grabbing. But for us, our big toe does not oppose the other four toes for grabbing nothing because it's flattened out. Okay, so there's been a displacement of the toe in bipedalism to go flat with the other four. And you know how people with the diabetes, they can get an infection of a toe and then that can eventually cause gangrene if it's not treated well. And because it's the, which is the furthest point of our body to the heart? The toes, right? The toes. And so it's the poorest circulation. That's why frostbite can bite off toes, can freeze toes, uh, because it's the further circulation from the heart. So basically, toes are a problem. And so why don't we just cut off the toes and live without toes? And the podiatrist said, no, don't do that. <laughs> because you're going to be stumbling all over the place. You're going to be falling over because the toe gives us a fine tuning on how to step and not lose our balance. So the toes give us the fine tuning down to the millimeter on how to step, but it's all subconscious. It's all part of the motor system that we don't think about it. But if we were to have the toes missing, we'd be stumbling all over the place. We'd be so unbalanced. We couldn't really walk much. Hmm? We'll be stumbling and falling all over the place. So the toes have a function. <laughs> it's kind of a secondary function from grabbing, uh, from prehensile, because uh, if our ancestors were arboreal, then all four legs were clasping or hanging on. But it's a secondary adaptation by becoming terrestrial and bipedal. Okay, so now let's look at all three together. Uh, just uh, the last 30 seconds or so. Comparing skulls, face, and then the characteristics as they match. Yeah, a very awkward gait of uh, the chimp, of the astralo. So they're using the chimp as kind of a modern representative of the southern apes. 
Okay, that's enough. Let's get back to our point here. How did this bipedalism come about? Well, like Meyer says, you know, we only have, we don't view evolution taking place. We see the effect, the result of the process. So we have to infer how it happened. And this is with a desertification, a desertification of equatorial Africa or Africa in general, right? So a desertification meaning that the climate got warmer and warmer and drier, sorry, drier and drier. So hypothetically, bipedalism could develop starting from tree climbing primates that we see in the old world monkeys and the new world monkeys or more distant relatives in the primate, right? In the order, these guys, they're all tree climbing and tree hanging and tree moving. in a tropical rainforest where it's a lush, lush jungle. You can really go for long distance without getting down to the ground, just from tree to tree, from branch to branch, etc. cetera. Okay. Kind of like the squirrels do around here today that they can jump from tree to tree, etc. Now, if this climate, so this is now warm and humid. A tropical rainforest by definition is warm and humid. Think of the Congo Basin, think of the Amazon Basin. Now there is a desertification. In other words, the climate starts getting drier. The ones that are gonna suffer the most first are the plants that need the largest volume of water, which are the trees, the bigger, taller trees, okay? So it's gonna be a transition toward what is known as a tree savanna. So from a tropical rainforest, Fast forwarding to a tree savanna where only a few trees get to survive. The vast majority of trees, species, think for example of the banyan tree that we have around here, Ficus multifolia from India originally. You know, but the figs and all these, they take large volumes of water. They're super, that's why they break pipes because they're hydrophilic. They love water and they wrap around the pipes. The, 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 the roots are so robust. So if water starts escaseando, starts becoming scant, the first trees to are selected out are the ones that need most water. So the trees that need least water are the ones that are gonna survive on average, right? Well, those are different types of acacias, which are spiny, also to protect their fewer leaves uh, from predators. And acacia trees, they have the little tiny leaves uh, and have these tall trunks, etc. So it's a transition, more scanty. In other words, now there's all the animals that were living up here within the forest uh, canopy, right? And the understory, no, the understory is all the foliage that is right under the canopy. They're going to have to either move out or die, <laughs> migrate or uh, perish. Hmm? So trees are becoming more scant. You can see then that going to the ground is going to be a survival skill, going down to the ground, to the actual savanna, hmm? to the grassy area. As that desertification continues, eventually the acacias start disappearing the vast majority of trees disappear, and the only thing that's left is some bushes and mostly grass, tall grasses. Sorry, yeah, that's uh, so tall grasses, and that's what is known as a bush savanna, in contrast with a tree savanna, because now we got no trees in the general area except back in the background, but more and more the region is becoming a bush savanna. So the, one has to survive in the bush and has to survive 
in the savanna, in the grass. So as these primates came down from the trees, evolving, there was a selective pressure to go into bipedalism. And the fossil record substantiates that. But before we go to substantial to the fossil record, I want to show you two maps here. This is a, an actual photograph. This is a satellite image, satellite image of Africa today. And you can also see the Arabian Peninsula. You can see the Mediterranean here, the Iberic Peninsula, the Italian Peninsula, etc. Middle East developing over here. But basically, there is a Congo Basin that I was talking about. Here is Lake Victoria. And here is that J-shape Great Rift Valley, right? Madagascar. OK, so you see the Sahara, the Sahel as a boundary. This is a photograph image of today, Africa. Now, the experts, the geologists, the climatologists, and the botanists, and ecologists, and all these specialists tell us that this is an approximation of how Africa was about 14 million years ago. Much greener, this is what we call a tropicalization of the earth, right? That tropical rainforest, that Congo Basin, which much more extent, in fact, it covered the bulk of the African continent, and there were only three smaller regions of savanna or maybe even desert at the top, the northwestern tip of Africa, the southwestern tip of Africa, and the northeastern, which is actually the Arabian Peninsula. But keep in mind, the Arabian Peninsula belongs to a different plate. So technically, you know, it's not Africa. It's not the African plate, tectonic plate, right? So you can see there was much more, that tropical rainforest was much more extensive, essentially covered the bulk of the African continent. That's 14 million years ago before the development of the primates uh, and certainly before the divergence between the Hominini and the Gorillini, which happened about 6 million years ago. So it fits within the time range of this transition of desertification to from a tropical rainforest to a savanna, to bush savanna, where bipedalism is more convenient because first I have no trees to climb on, and secondly, I better run faster from the enemy who's just behind. Okay, but also train the hands and speaking of the enemy and the selective pressure of the predator prey, right? We are predators for many other species, but we're also prey of other species, of typically of the top carnivores. And in Africa, it's going to be things like the lion, the puma, the cheetah, <laughs> and all these uh, uh, um, felines with a nasty disposition, <laughs> with large, overgrown canine teeth to bite right into our jugglers to. Uh, to stop us right there on our tracks. So bipedalism was a good survival skill to, to develop. Mm -hmm. And so going back to Lucy to complete that uh, discourse. Remember, she's an Australopithecine. So she doesn't belong to the Homo, she's Australopithecus. But she's already bipedal. Uh, average just a little over half our size, okay? How do we know she's bipedal? Because this is a reconstruction from this, which is really not that much, okay? But it happens that where this was found, in other words, all the remnants of the skeleton, it was on a muddy region, sediment, sediment that left tracks, tracks. So remember tracks are also another type of fossil. Mm -hmm. 
And so we can put uh, Lucy tracks. Oh no. <laughs> about Lucy Footprints. Have to be careful what you Google these days. You may not get what you're looking for. <laughs> Especially when I do it in class. All right. So these are essentially the Lucy tracks. All right. These are her. So we know she was a female and these are possibly her kid. <laughs> It's smaller tracks of the same species, of the same individual, bipedal. As you can see, the gait, left, right, oh, sorry, left, right, left, right, left, right. Okay, and it goes on, on the mud, and they have been studied, and uh, the bones were found nearby. Then other tracks have been found. Then there are other tracks of other animals that go through the region also. Uh, it's not known exactly if they were contemporary or not, but there are other animal tracks that go through this muddy region. But uh, these are the Lucy tracks, which have been studied extensively to figure out her weight, her biomass, and all that by the print on the that's left on the mud. Mm -hmm. Yep. Scroll to the uh, say scroll to the top where you have the prints. Yeah. Before. Because See? I think that it looks like there was a PBS special on it. Oh, yeah? Okay. Let's take a look. I saw. National I Geographic. PBS, yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay. There you go. Yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Feel free to explore any of these, right? They've matched it up. Uh, here's another track of what looks like a feline. It looks like the paw of like a lion or something like that, possibly. Then they've made human tracks to see what they how they compare, doing some measurements. Here are some human tracks superimposed. Lots of studies. Yep. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Here's an article from Newsweek. Let's see if it's from the time. No. Oh, this is just today. But I wanted to see if it was historical. 2007. Most complete example. They're, the, back here in 2007, they were. This was displayed at a uh, museum in Austin, Texas, or no, in August <laughs> in Texas, Museum of Natural History. Okay. Anyway, here's evidence of southern apes that had developed already bipedalism. So bipedalism is not exclusive to the genus Homo, all right? So it started uh, just before the divergence. That's six million years ago. However, the freeing up of the hands by bipedalism then allows the hands to get busy with something else. And it's going to be tools. And now here you can see a, at least an association, what they call the hand, eye, motor um, association, okay? That our eyes focus with our hands to do something and that stimulates the brain to do something else and something more. So there's a learning behavior that we do watching our hands making things and coming, oh, I did it this way, maybe I can make it more this way, sharper, this age, etc. So tools emerge, okay? Tools emerge. And on the homo line, there is the evidence of uh, using tools. So, but it's not just using tools, but actual tool making tool making, which is another level. It's another level. Now, how do we know that these Australopithecines, for example, were making, uh, had tools to make tools? Of course, we're not talking about a machine that makes a motor, for example, the parts of a motor or a piston or anything like that. 
the technology is very primitive. The most primitive technology that we can think of, you know, in the caricatures of the, plin the Flintstones. Well, it's about stone. This is the Stone Age, precisely. Okay? So to take a, to use a stone as a knife, for example, a sharp stone, like uh, Dr. Plunkett said, with uh, with a uh, shale, which is a sedimentary rock, they're layered, so you can get a sharp edge from that. So using a stone as a knife is using a tool. But making a knife is a different story. It's another layer. It's a layer that is a much more complex activity of the brain of reasoning, which is to use a tool to make another tool. How can we get some inference of that by looking at what's left, at what is known as the material culture that is left behind? The fragments of whatever is left behind. Say around the campfire, if we see cans or bottles around the campfire, we can tell what those people ate and drank, right? Well, going back, we can see there are tools that were left behind were stones, but some stones were sharp but other stones were blunt, but have impact sections on them. So it's estimated that some stones were used to break other stones. And that was the first tool that made another tool, all right? To use one stone to break another stone of different consistency, right? That needs to think of what needs to go on in the brain to figure out what tool, what stone I'm gonna to use to break another stone for the second stone to get a sharp edge out of it. Well, obviously the first stone has to be harder than the second stone. And the second stone should be more glassy-like, have crystals in it to make that sharp edge, right? So different types of stones. That takes a brain process, that takes a, a, a thinking process to, to develop that. And that's a selective advantage because now I can make tools. I can take the harder stone with me and then just work with the local stones that I find for making my edges along the way. Anyway, one thing is to use a, a tool and the other thing is to make a tool, to, make, uh, to use a tool to make another tool. And that's what has been found already with the Australopithecines. And so that goes back to about two and a half million years ago, which is when we have the third break with a homo, homo father, right? Or sorry, homo habilis, dates back to about two and a half million years ago. So that's the first break. Further is the harnessing of fire. So if we can assume that the Australopithecines did have tools, and tools to make tools. Let me go back to this diagram again. Okay, so here are the Australopithecines and we find those tool making capacity right here around the break with Africanus. Now in that uh, two and a half million years, the fathers we have found for harnessing fire, all right, has been about one million year, one million year. So the break into mostly Europe with Heidelbergensis. Let me show you that evidence. It's a cave precisely, I think it's in, uh, oh, it's in South Africa. All right, Wunderwerk, Wunderwerk Cave, obviously a German name, the people who discovered it, the anthropologists, maybe it was the German team, in other words, the Wonder, Wunderwerk uh, Cave in South Africa. Here's a photo of it. As you can see, it's all sectioned out for study by little layers. A lot of work is going in here. And here, scientists have found these charts, charts of charcoal. Now, how do they know that this is campfire charcoal as opposed to non-campfire charcoal? Sorry. 
because here's the point. Where's this will be an arrow around here that can go back. Uh, why is it not here? Oh. Oh well. I lost, I lost the arrow. Okay, look at this. This is a microscopic image of sediment that is burnt bone, right? This piece here, this part of it. This is burnt bone according to the experts from mineral analysis, carbon dating, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing is this, that depends on the temperature at which the bone was burned. It will get a different configuration and different chemical consistency, all right? And they can tell from the difference in the structure of, of the chart was left that this was more like a campfire like fire than a wildfire. Okay, in other words, this bone was burnt on purpose with a campfire and not a wildfire. Because apparently the temperature is different from these two. And therefore the charred bone structure fragment is different from a wildfire burn or from a campfire burn. And the experts are telling us that this is the product of a fire of a campfire burn. You can see some of the pieces of coal, the black uh, left behind, right? And ashes. And this was found in this cave, which goes back to about 1 million years ago. So this is the earliest evidence that we have so far of harnessing fire. Hmm? Now, Going into the last layer of what really makes us human, this would be strictly on the homo line. Things like art, burying the dead, clothing, and ultimately religion. In other words, a sense of worship, a sense of other who is not us, who is a supreme being or supreme beings, in what we call, what we could call it idolatry today, but back then was a mixture of superstition and magic and worship. But in other words, the recognition of a supreme being or supreme beings, beings that don't exist here on earth all the time anyway, and are superior to anything that we see in the natural world. That's really the origin of religion and ritual. Which is very much associated with art. You think of liturgical art, music, and painting, and so forth. It can have a religious connotation. So these are characteristics that are very strictly in the human line. So let me show you some evidence, for example, of burying the dead. Now we know we're the only animals on Earth that bury their dead. Okay? Now there are anecdotes of. Uh, mama elephants staying with dead baby elephant for a while and trying to kind of dig a hole around the baby elephant and so forth, but it's very scant. They don't really bury it dead and certainly they don't bury it with artifacts in the same grave, okay? Uh, there are also anecdotes and actual films that I've seen of mama dolphins. See, Dolphins are uh, mammals, right? They're marine mammals, but they're mammals, which means they have lungs and not gills, which means they need to breathe from the surface periodically. That's why the blowhole, the nose, has migrated to the top of the brain, to the top of the head, which is the blowhole, so that they can breathe without putting the whole head out of, out of the water. And so baby dolphin, the newborn, has to learn how to breathe from the surface. It's an acquired behavior. And the... Uh, the mother, once she gives birth, uh, the mother comes underneath the baby dolphin and pushes the baby dolphins to the surface for the baby dolphin to breathe, beginning with the first breath of air. 
okay? And she has to do that apparently for several hours to train that baby to go to the surface and breathe because the baby is coming out of a liquid environment, right? The placenta and the meiotic fluid and all that, mammal, umbilical cord, pregnancy, et cetera. And so the baby is coming out of the liquid environment can distinguish really from the inside the womb and outside the womb, it's all liquid anyway. <laughs> the missing part is the umbilical cord. So needs oxygen to breathe. Those lungs need to go up to the surface uh, continuously for the rest of his or her life. And so that's a, a behavior that the dolphin needs to learn. And the mama dolphin does that. Well, there are anecdotes and there are actual films of baby dolphins who died maybe at birth or just, just after birth. And that mama dolphin keeps bringing that baby to the first surface. The, the baby, the dead baby keeps bringing him or her to the surface getting tired for hours doing that, getting tired, the mama dolphin was still alive, and by getting tired, exposing herself to risk of being of succumbing to a shark attack or something like that, because the enemy is not far away anytime. And so, but it's not really burying the dead with ritual or anything like we do, correct? So the tombs that have been found, the oldest tombs today, in Israel, which happens to be a transition area precisely between Africa and Europe. It's the Middle East, right? It's the Middle East, it's a transition area geographically between in Africa and Europe. And this is the cave, is the Kwasef Cave, Kwasef Cave in uh, Israel. And it goes back to about 100,000 years ago when we have definitely anatomically modern human. Okay? anatomically modern human, back to about 100,000 years ago. However, in France, Chapelle aux Sons, right, which is near the Saint Chapelle, Chapelle aux Sons in Africa, um, in France, there's a burial site that is a Neanderthal burial site 50,000 years ago. Exactly. And so there is a coexistence here, at least of 50,000 years between sapiens and Neanderthal. And the good thing about this grave is that the skeleton is pretty much complete, and especially the skull. And this fellow was definitely Neanderthal, not sapiens. Okay. So there is an overlap there. Very interesting, for several thousand years between Neanderthal and Sapiens, and it was back and forth and back and forth until the Neanderthals were uh, wiped out. So, bottom line, no one disputes the likelihood that uh, the Homo genus started in Africa and migrated eventually out of Africa. What is still controversial is how many migration waves and over what period of time. So if there was one single migration that developed eventually into uh, uh, us, right, as our phylogenetics, or if there were several waves, and if there were several waves, was there interbreeding and so forth, different varieties? It's hard to tell, the, the picture here, it's very fussy between variety and species, okay? But basically, anywhere between 1 million on the outside to 200,000 years ago on the closest end. That's the range. Geographically, here's the Horn of Africa, as you can see. And the land masses that are shown, the red, the red perimeter is today's geography, today's coastline, right? But the blue is coastline of about 65,000 uh, 65, years ago. So for example, the most dramatic one is around Australia and New Guinea, which are two islands today, actually Australia continent and New Guinea uh, an island. 
But back then they had a landmass that connected them. Okay, so it was a single landmass with a, uh, an isthmus there, and isthmus is a narrowing, but also a lot of um, Southeast Asia was connected back then, just 65,000 years ago, landmass. And again, the brown line is today's contour uh, shoreline. Africa, a little bit, extended a little bit the coastline, especially the horn here. But then it, it's pretty much the same coastline as it was back then. The migration is supposed to have happened from if the origin of, at least at the level of genus, Homo, happened here, somewhere around the, here's the Great Rift Valley, migrated toward the coast. And then what do you do when you get to the coast? or you either go up or down, right? So that's precisely the fossil record seems to indicate that. There was a migration south and another migration north, and then coasting along the coastline because why the coastline? Again, think of the Arabic Peninsula. See, so follow the green, the green, which is the migration route all the way along the coastline. This is India here down into uh, Southeast Asia. And the coastline, because, for example, look at the Arabic Peninsula. If you go inland, you're in a desert. What kind of food are you going to find there? Very difficult. But if you stay on the coastline, at least the coastline is rich in marine life. Hmm? So it's a natural thing. They were following the food sources that were available to them. And it's uh, logical to see how fishing techniques developed. And then you get into the details of the fossil record and the material culture that was left behind. You even start seeing hooks made out of bone, etc. So all that along the coast. Okay, so the two pervading models today is still controversial if it was out of Africa by a single wave or multi-wave and multi-regional, several clans, let's say, of the tribe moving in various directions. That's what's still uh, not uh, fully determined because again, the paucity of the record, of the fossil record, right? The more fossils are found and artifacts, and material culture, then this picture will become more complete. So that eventually moves to other continents. And this is a uh, map uh, of a possibility of migration. This one actually has a stronger route moving straight north from the from the Congo Basin into to cross the Arabic Peninsula or the Straits. What is this? The Suez Canal, right? Into the Arabic Peninsula, and then from the Middle East, another focal point of radiation, either east toward Europe or west toward Asia. That would be the land uh, route. The terrestrial route, the coastal route would be just hugging the coast all the way down uh, uh, to India and continuing all the way down into South America, into Australia with different timelines. But within 10,000 years, it's estimated that humans uh, colonized, uh, bless you, uh, arrived in Australia already, which is the southernmost point there on the Pacific uh, before Antarctica, right? Continue up the coast then, you get into the Chinese region. And then finally, the Bering Straits up here, connecting Alaska with Siberia during uh, winters, certain winters when it's extreme cold, every, I don't know how many decades, there's an ice sheet that actually forms there. And uh, there's migration of mammals 
across to populate then North America and eventually South America and even into Greenland, which is the most recent population of uh, uh, the genus of Homo, all the way to six, uh, as recent as 46,000 years ago. North America in the teens from, let's say, 20 to 10,000 years ago. In the meantime, there was a glaciation that was occurring here. So ice age, the most recent ice age, which uh, receded 10 to 12,000 years ago, but that ice age never covered the peninsula of Florida or the Caribbean, obviously. And so these regions remain available for animals and plants, including humans to move into the region. And so the Tequesca ancestors of the peninsula of Florida go back to about 10,000 years ago in Florida. Okay. And it matches this migration pattern. Okay, uh, yes, there's another one called the Nosivans, the then Denisovans, Denisovans, which was another clan that developed here in Southeast Asia, where there have been some interaction. There is uh, an island called the Isla of Flores. Flores Island. Is this gonna be big enough? Yeah, cool. Yeah, so Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore. This little island here is called the Island of Flores. And there was a fossil found fairly recently, just a few years ago, called Homo floresensis. I don't know if you heard of uh, Homo floresensis. There it is. Again, it's another little guy who was found there. In fact, there are the Komodo dragons <laughs> are also in that region. And the Komodo dragons were actually larger than the Homo floresensis. Anyway, that's not what I want to show. Uh, to look for, if, well, so here are skulls, here's sapiens, and here's fluorescences, okay? Again, with the caveat that we don't know that this skull is actually normative for the whole species, but uh, assuming that it's a variation back and forth, uh, first, the size itself is uh, much smaller, but also, but the facial features are very similar to the um, to sapiens. So here's kind of a reconstruction of fluorescences. Okay, and this is one that has been found recently. Is facing head on, fairly similar facing head on, but uh, smaller. So he's like a midget. Uh, here's a nice comparison of various calls. So he's being classified as a hominin, a homo, all right, but not sapiens. Anyway, um, this is kind of the most recent. And we're now going to make the transition, finally, toward the more theological or religious aspect of um, 
uh, course, complementing what we have seen so far, because maybe at this point, some of you may say, well, then there's ample evidence for the phylogenetic origin of the human species. It's all about evolution. And we just stop there and we stay with Darwin and no one else. <laughs> but now we have to deal, since this is a Catholic uh, program, uh, we have to deal with the other side of the coin, the flip side of the coin, which is, well, then what do we do with religion and faith and the uh, biblical narrative and basically coming down to what do we do with Adam and Eve? You know, did they exist? Or was it just a myth and it's just allegorical and there's no substance to it? So I'm going to leave you with that question mark because that's where I'm going to pick up the next lecture next Saturday, which is no, next Saturday is Holy Saturday. Oh, yes. So next Saturday is no, no class. <laughs> tomorrow is Palm Sunday. Yes, already. So tomorrow begins, the, actually with the vigil, this, this evening begins Holy Week, the most holy and important week of the year for uh, Christianity, because we are remembering, once again, reliving the Paschal mystery of the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And therefore, uh, this Sunday is... Passion Sunday, also known as Palm Sunday, and next Sunday is Easter Sunday. So Saturday, we call it Holy Saturday, where Jesus was in the tomb. If Jesus rested, we better rest too. <laughs> okay, It's actually a very busy time in the parish, so I won't be around. You're welcome to come, but I'm not going to be here. <laughs> okay. So uh, what I wanted to show you is this. This is the last slide. We're going to segue into uh, the theological analysis of evolution of the human, of the human species, the phylogenetics of the human species, right? And how to see if there is a compatibility between the biblical, biblical narrative of creation, especially the book of Genesis chapters one and two. So the Bible has 73 books, 46 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. It's actually a library of books that spans centuries between one another. But of those 73 books, the first one, not chronologically by way of writing, by way of the oldest, but thematically, the oldest one is the book of Genesis. Precisely, it's called that way because it describes the origins from a religious perspective, the origin of humans, right? Beginning with Adam and Eve the first human couple on earth, according to the biblical narrative. We're going to go into a detailed analysis of the Hebrew language and Adam and Eve and all that, and see possible uh, associations with the, with the biological, with the scientific uh, data. But for now, I'm going to leave with this thought and <coughs> a little homework for you to look up, since you have now two weeks for the next. So the next class, next uh, lecture is <clears throat> what is known as mitochondrial Eve. And then oh, more uh, recently, Y chromosome Adam. Okay. Now these two terms, these are not biblical terms. These are scientific terms. Mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam. Just start by Googling it and start reading up on it, right? See how far you get. But these are scientific uh, terms <laughs> because it turns out that the mitochondria are maternally inherited, okay? They're maternally inherited because between the sperm and the egg, which one has more volume, more cytoplasm? The egg. The egg has more cytoplasm than the sperm, right? And so the sperm is basically just a nuclear DNA package with a membrane and a tail, the flagellum for motility. But the egg is actually a full round cell that has much more cytoplasm because the egg stays put and it's waiting for the sperm to, to fertilize, uh, to come and fertilize. <laughs> so by volume, the egg, the ovum, is much larger and has 
more mitochondria. Now the sperm does have some mitochondria because the mitochondria are the energy factory of the cell, right? Remember they recharge ATPs and therefore they're involved in metabolism, which is another word for life, at least on earth as we know it. And there are several thousand mitochondria in each uh, cell of the body normally. So they're there, they're quite abundant. And the egg, the ovum is no exception. Um, when I Googled this, I remember yeah. sharing this with me in yeah. one of the first classes. I first Googled. Yeah. You don't necessarily, I mean, I guess depending on who you're reading, yeah. it'll tell you that there really is no actual proof or evidence that it goes back to like one, you know, anatomy. Right. Um, right. So. Exactly. Because again, it's the, it's the whole issue of we can only infer the past, right? right? There is no fossil record of either Adam's sperm or Eve's uh, ova. <laughs> right, right. And therefore, we have to infer from the lines of evidence pointing in that direction. Right. But what we can infer from um, the mitochondria, since it's mostly maternally, maternally inherited, get, get a little bit into the next lecture, but let me let me set it up. So Consider the, the egg, the female egg, which has the mitochondria, and mitochondria have their own DNA, which codes mostly for the proteins that make up the mitochondria. <laughs> okay. So the sperm also has some mitochondria because uh, sperm is motile and needs actually quite a few ATPs to get to its destination, right? Which is to fertilize the egg all the way to the ampulla of the fallopian tubes. Therefore, the sperm also has mitochondria. And at fertilization, the sperm is actually poured into the egg uh, mechanically. And so some male mitochondria do go into the egg, but very few. I remember way back uh, a few years ago, uh, I was uh, living in Boston and uh, uh, I looked at the New England, New England Journal of Medicine had an article on male mitochondria in the human species, that there are a few that are there. So it's not a hundred, our mitochondria is not a hundred percent inherited by maternally inherited. We have a few male mitochondria, but very, very few. It's a double whammy. Not only are there many more mitochondria in the egg than the sperm of the human, okay? I don't know by what order of magnitude, but uh, certainly many more just by volume. But also in addition to that, the few mitochondria that are in the sperm at fertilization are and male, male mitochondria that are emptied out into the egg. The egg detects them as a foreign object and, yes. and uh, digest them. <laughs> the lysosomes get to them and digest them as a foreign organelle. So it's kind of analogous to uh, uh, organ transplant. Our immune system attacks the foreign organ, right? And so the same way, the immune system, if you will, of the egg attacks the male mitochondria as a foreign organelles. <laughs> so very few get to survive. A few do survive and they're there. And so we inherit it. But the vast majority of our mitochondria are inherited maternally. In other words, my mitochondria and my whole body as a man come from my mother, <laughs> the vast majority. Of and so does everybody else's. So when we do that, and we do a phylogenetic analysis of mitochondria, we see, and then we sample women throughout the world we see the percentage and we and we do the phylogenetics on the on the mitochondrial DNA. We see the percentage homology there, and we see that it points to a common female. Now, a common female doesn't mean one individual necessarily. All right? A common mother doesn't mean one individual, because genetically, a small group of individuals may be considered 
analogous to one, in other words, by way of uh, genetic diversity. I'm thinking of the example of the cheetah. At one point, the cheetah became so few, the number 80 comes to mind, but I can't tell you exactly what region. There was a population of cheetah that dwindled down to 80. But they were all so interrelated that they were as if it were a single individual. In other words, there was practically no variation. So genetically speaking, they could have been considered, those eight individuals were as good as one because there was practically no variation among them, right? They all came from a single mother, but they were so interbred that the variation was practically nil, all right? So what I'm pointing out is that mitochondrial E doesn't necessarily have to be a single individual woman, right? It could be a small number of them. Keeping in mind also, uh, in one sense, I'm just, I'm speculating here now because certainly way beyond my field, but considering that the standard in mammals between male and female is what? The standard is the, uh, the harem, the, um, what do you call that? Mm. When one, the alpha male has several females, right? The herd, the herd, okay? Now in the herd, there will be other males, but there's only one alpha male and the other ones are competing, trying to get to them and so forth. But generally it's the alpha male that on average gets to fertilize the majority of the females who are fertile at that time. And biologically speaking, we're mammals too. So it's not beyond reasoning to consider that the Y chromosome atom may have had several mitochondrial Eves <laughs> to fertilize, okay? And he was the alpha male and there were other uh, beta males around trying to compete with that Y chromosome atom, waiting for that atom to get old enough to be beaten, taken off, right? So that then the beta ma male would replace and so forth. But my point about it is that it's a Y chromosome Eve and, and uh, Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve don't necessarily have to be one individual. They can be a small group that are so mm, related phylogenetically that as far as the genetics is concerned, they're as if they were one, all right? And so even though the Bible speaks as Adam and Eve in the singular, it could be a singular small group of individuals. As long as we do not interpret the Bible literally because we're not fundamentalists. And that's really, I'm gonna stop there, otherwise I'm going to the next lecture. <laughs> but uh, do, do a little research on these two, which are scientific terms, okay? And then uh, we'll pick up on that in two weeks. Okay, folks, that's all I have for you. All right, Professor. Okay, Venetia, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I was late, by the way. Okay, well, uh, no problem, but hang on because I did email you the evaluation form. Mm -hmm. seen it. So download it somehow, fill it in, and somehow. Okay. Send let it, me, uh, let me look at it now. Yeah, okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. so let's send that filled in to Dr. Plunkett, email it to him, all right? Yes, so perfect. So Good, I got name. it. Thank you. Okay, make sure you put my name on the form and not your name. Yeah. Okay, got it. <laughs> okay, Denisha. Okay, thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thanks. Okay, let me close this.